uh, I, my next, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Tom Noseworthy, who's taken on a very large challenge in Alberta to align and mobilize and engage a large group of clinical leaders to advance best practice and to get them more engaged in processes of care. Tom. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you. I have 10 quick minutes to get the job done. The only point I'm gonna make about that, Terry, is to marvel at the amazing differences in my perceptions of what a 10 minute quickie is now compared to years ago. <laughs> uh, I wanna talk about strategic clinical networks. Um, more about structure than the type of process uh, things we've just heard about. Um, and let me introduce you to the Texas of the North. If you haven't met Alberta Health Services yet, you will soon. The minister has left. He did, gave us a great chat today and uh, we're pleased with his leadership, but I might just say off the record that Alberta Health Services was done to us. We didn't sit down and invent this. Uh, and now we're trying to put it together and make it work. And it's four years old, and I think it's beginning to start to show evidence uh, that it may well become the best healthcare system in Canada. Now, let's uh, realize that it's large. Sometimes I worry about whether the economies of scale and scope will turn down and whether we can be successful, but it's a big organization. We're spending a lot of money, um, and uh, as I say, we're only four years old. Um, when Dr. Eagle took, a member of this organization, took over a few years ago, he added the five zones to bring the management closer to where care was taking place, and we've introduced the networks in 2012, which is what I'm here to chat with you about. Nine of them have been launched. There are six more in the planning, uh, in the planning phases. So these strategic clinical networks, as we call them, are the mechanisms whereby we're hoping to accomplish many of the types of things that you've heard about and we've talked about today. Uh, it's important to say that um, Alberta is not a very friendly place right now. It's somewhat of a toxic environment. There's a serious dispute going on between government and physicians. Let's be clear about that. And uh, here I am trying to engender clinician engagement and doing the kinds of things that really do need to get done. Our physicians have left the table, for better or for worse, regardless of what they're paid. They're an unhappy lot. And yet we need physicians to help us turn around the system and to improve clinical outcomes. We need all kinds of clinicians for that. But we definitely got to get physicians back to the table in Alberta to produce clinically led change. Drive it with performance measurement and management. Drive it with best practice. Certainly we're enthusiastic about using tools like clinical care pathways and models of best practice and models of care. Because from that, once we've established what the standard of care is, uh, based on what the clinicians say it ought to be and the evidence that underpins that, then we can engage in clinical uh, variance uh, measurement and management. It is really about time, not just comparing zone to zone to zone or facility to facility to facility, but comparing doctor to doctor to doctor in terms of the quality of the outcomes uh, that are achieved and what we can do to make them better. That's our mission with strategic clinical networks. So what are the why, what, and hows of, uh, of those networks? Well, the goals are clear. Uh, we want to achieve the best outcomes, the highest quality, uh, greatest value, and we've got to get clinicians back to the table, which is a daunting proposition at this point in time. Why? Uh, we have shown before that we've had networks previously within Alberta, and they have been beneficial. The uh, Ontario Cancer Care Network, uh, networks in Scotland, uh, Australia, New Zealand, clinical networks are not new, uh, and um, we want to take this up to a, 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 the next level. We think that they're a great uh, mechanism for joint uh, collaboration, decision making, and, and, and learning. And we think this is the structure that, provided with the right set of analytic tools, can begin to start looking at that thorny issue of clinical practice variation and uh, how to, uh, um, first of all, diagnose it and there where appropriate, treat it. So what are these things called these networks? Um, you know, fully formed uh, and ultimately, like our current bone and joint network now has gotten quite big over the years, but fully formed, we would like to see the networks be all encompassing, all inclusive, hundreds if not thousands of, of people. Uh, 
but they had to be led by clinicians. So we have some uh, rules about who can be a core member, et cetera, but led by clinicians, driven by clinical need, focused specifically on achieving the best possible outcomes. Now to make a large, all intensive, big tent approach like that work, we have 25 core members. So this could be a little group of 25 core members for, for one of the networks. So who's in that group? And that's where I think it starts getting more interesting. Of course, there'll be the requisite specialist physicians and primary care physicians, uh, other non-physician clinicians on every one of those networks. In fact, we have a rule that in the core membership of 25, 50% must be demonstrable as practicing clinicians. Uh, and every network must have patients. And thanks to this foundation, we have been delighted to have patients that we've had a grant for where we've trained them in research over the last year, three times a week they come. They've learned all kinds of interesting things about focus groups and um, sampling, et cetera. Uh, and now those patients with that year of research experience are now uh, moved into and become part of our core membership. And I'll guarantee you I'll guarantee you it changes the dialogue. Um, and so besides the other members, the core members, we've also equipped this with some leadership. We've taken senior clinicians uh, and produced a senior medical director for each of those networks, uh, a vice president as well. Uh, and then uh, to make it really novel, we've had a scientific director to each one of those networks. We've picked people that have strong, robust research careers already that are well-funded, and their uh, remit is to put together a research network, an evidence-developing, producing, and using network around this network of clinicians to create clinical change. And so what will the networks and how will the networks actually work? They have to have a broad mandate. We've picked the network specifically to either pick off a specific population, a high um, uh, impact area, or a high burden area. So you can see some of the network names there, which I'll mention in just a moment. Uh, the remit of each network must start upstream. They must do work in uh, proximate types of health determinants work. Uh, they must do health promotion, disease prevention work, and they must carry on uh, their line of work to end of life care. So a broad scope starting with population health and ending with palliation. And the projects and activities that they are undertaking and that are funded for are meant to, uh, to change outcomes and deal with that uh, scope uh, of care, particularly with attention to reducing clinical practice variation. And they're resourced. Each one has a dedicated uh, business intelligence unit. So if you call together the little unit for that network, you have a clinical analytics person show up, an HTA person, someone that can do some reassessment for us as well, someone from patient safety, pathway development, et cetera. So you can see in that little list an interesting cadre of people that we've embedded within the network and included that we've embedded some research capability within each of those networks. We've trained up the leaders in a very intense five-day program of very directed learning skills and contents, uh, and we've given some seed money to move this forward. So the scientific director positions have about $200,000 within their their kitty, uh, and it's not a huge amount of money, but it's just something to at least bring together the intent of a research evidence-based initiative with structures that involve clinicians. Here's the first six that we've launched, addiction and mental health, two previously separate communities. Uh, problem, given that addiction is about 50% of mental health problems and 50% of mental health problems have addictions, we put them together. Bone and joint, which was around for a while, cancer care, which is a common sense one to do. Cardiovascular and stroke was never one in our province, unbelievable. You know, the same vascular disease, just a different vascular bed, and they never really got together and now they have. We created a new one, Obesity, Diabetes, and Nutrition, and Seniors Health. And those six are now launched, and there's six more coming in the new fiscal year, which I won't dwell on. This is the project list, which you can't read. And I, I only put it up there to say that each one now has got to have some serious projects. But here's an example of why we need to do the project work. This is Stroke Outcomes in Canada. Thank you to John Wright's wonderful organization that shows comparative zones, the five zones on the left, and then the best performer on the right. And there's reams of these slides on their website. I just picked this one because Calgary is the best performer. So if you're going to have a stroke, folks, do it in Calgary because you'll have the best possible outcomes. Uh, and if you're going to have myocardial infarction, just to be fair to Edmonton, you'd be best to do that in the uh, 
province's capital because they have the best 30-day readmission rates for myocardial infarction. So that kind of data is out there for us now to be looking at comparatively, and we need to be comparing ourselves with the best and trying to reduce the variations. So because of that, if you did a little arithmetic between the highest bar and the lowest bar there, you'd have a great big difference in outcomes. So that's why we've initiated the cardiovascular rural stroke program, which the network is going to look after. Don't worry about the details. The intent here is generalize what we've learned in the large urban areas like Calgary to the rural areas to change stroke outcomes. And another one that we're doing in concert with uh, the Alberta government, and we're pleased to do this with the ministry, and that's the Sea Change Initiative, which you're going to hear about from the next speaker. Thanks very much. Ten minutes.